Golden Slacks said something rather remarkable recently. They believe that up to half of all behind-the-meter power generation could come from fuel cells. Modular fuel cell systems can be deployed in less than a year. They're 10 to 30 percent more efficient than gas turbines, and they produce fewer emissions. And the leader in fuel cells right now seems to be Bloom Energy. It's a company that's been raised by quite a few of our premium subscribers, the people that pay the bills. So let's analyze this company together and see if it would make for a good investment. So some questions we'll want to consider. A big problem for a number of the larger fuel cell companies is profitability. So you want to ask the question, how profitable could this venture be? Because it's sort of assumed that in early days you won't be profitable, but the potential for profitability shows up in gross margins. Then you want to look at what the recurring revenues look like for these companies. So once they've sold the hardware, are they making any money servicing it? How often do they have to replace this hardware? What's the margin on services revenues? Things like that. And in the case of Bloom, the question is, well, how fast can they scale to meet demand? And if that's going to take them too long, then other sources of energy are going to come online down the road and potentially steal their total addressable market. And a very important question that relates to that, what's the cost of producing energy with these fuel cells? Because once you get down the road and past all this AI hype, companies are going to start looking at costs and paying a lot closer attention to things like reducing costs. And they're going to perhaps swap out these stop gap energy solutions with ones that are more efficient and less costly. So when we look at what Bloom Energy does, it's really quite simple. They turn natural gas into electricity. That's how a fuel cell works. Of course, they can use hydrogen or biogas, but the premise is pretty simple. And one of the advantages that fuel cells have is that they're modular. So when you're providing a data source for a data center and it's all coming from, let's say, one single source, you have to have a duplicate source as a backup. Well, with fuel cells, because it's modular, you may they need to only have two modules as backups because you'll never have more than, let's say, two that are out at any given time. And Goldman Sachs has identified fuel cells as a possible solution for all the power demand coming from AI data centers. They point to gas turbine lead times having stretched to over five years. We covered that in a past piece looking at companies like Cat and Cummins. Pay attention to the percentage of revenues that they're receiving from gas turbines if you're looking at those firms for exposure to that thesis. But modular fuel cell systems can be deployed in less than a year, as we said, 10 to 30 percent more efficient, meaning they require less natural gas. They operate with much less noise, fewer emissions, though that has been argued by some as not necessarily to be the case. They offer stronger load versatility than gas turbines. And they remove your dependency from the grid, though, to be fair, that's applicable for all behind the meter solutions. So Goldman estimates 8 to 20 gigawatts of fuel cell capacity required to supply electricity by 2030. So all the missing power that we don't have for data centers, they estimate that up to 50 percent of that may be addressed by fuel cells. And if you're wondering what 8 to 20 gigawatts looks like, well, 1.5 gigawatts would be how many fuel cells that Bloom Energy has already deployed. So across 1,200 sites, they have quite a few fuel cells in operation. And as I said earlier, looking at how fast they can scale, well, they say that they can ramp to two gigawatts capacity by the end of next year. So essentially, by that time, they'll be able to produce more than they have deployed right now in a single year. So that's very promising. They claim that these facilities are capable of scaling to five gigawatts as needed to match the demand. And of course, if there's strong demand, we want to see revenue growth. And when we look at their revenue growth over time, okay, for the past several years, it hasn't been overly promising, just in the double digits there at 11%. But they're expected to hit 19% growth this year. That's fairly impressive, I suppose. Management noted in their latest earnings call that they expect earnings to be better than what they've guided towards. And this is the midpoint that you see here, 19% growth. So we can assume they're going to have better growth than that. But revenue growth is one thing, but not all revenues are created equal. When we look at their gross margins, as I said, some of 
the companies out there like Plug or Ballard or Fuel Cell, they have negative gross margins. That means they're essentially subsidizing their products. And that's only going to last as long as you can raise capital, right? It's not a sustainable business. You can't produce a product or service and then sell it for less than it costs to produce. So you see here Bloom's gross margins rising over time. I suppose 30% is a lot better than negative gross margins. It's decent for a hardware company. And when it comes to operating margins, those are starting to move towards the positive. And that's very important when it comes to servicing their debt, which we're going to talk about here in a second. But when we look at where their gross profits are coming from, it's good to see 88% coming from product, the sale of fuel cells, which is where most of their revenues come from. And then we also see some other segments here that aren't so profitable. Services in particular is interesting because that's sort of where we're looking for recurring revenues, right? And if it has such a low gross margin, as you see here, 8%, then that doesn't bode well for recurring revenues down the road once they have all this hardware built out, right? So you want to pay attention to that. And also this electricity component, which essentially is Bloom operating their fuel cells and selling that electricity to clients. And there's been some questions around just how profitable that might be. That perhaps relates to this report here by Hindenburg Research. So this short report came out a long time ago. What I really like is that Bloom Energy responded to it. But one of the things that I noted in this short report that holds true today, and it popped up while we were researching this, is this reference to recourse debt. So I wasn't familiar with that term until I came across it here in their financials. And it's because not a lot of companies have recourse debt. It's usually labeled as long-term debt. And this relates to several convertible notes they have due in 2028 and 2029. So you're looking at three or four years from now. Hopefully that's not around the time that other energy sources are coming online and demand for their product legs and how are they going to come up with this money that they need to pay lenders, right? And when it comes to high recourse debt, I asked Grok about this, and you can argue it either way, but this, they say, is common in tech energy sectors where you have high upfront costs. What it means is that the lender is senior when it comes to what they can do to get their money back. So they can pretty much go in there and take whatever they want to get their money back. So the idea would be that you would only resort to such a source of money if you didn't have other alternatives, right? And companies then with all that leverage can put in place covenants and this is where you're essentially increasing bankruptcy risk. That's the argument there. That aside, this Forbes investigation notes how Bloom had actually restated prior four years financial statements, lowering revenues by up to 180 million and adding 75 million in losses. And they talked about how without subsidies, Bloom's fuel cells generate power at a cost of roughly 13.5 cents per kilowatt hour versus 10 cents for grid power nationally. And apparently the company wasn't being entirely honest about the cost of energy. And this goes on to talk about how without subsidies, you have solar and onshore wind, both at four cents per kilowatt, according to Lazard. We can argue about whether or not Lazard is accurate, but the point is that the cost of energy coming from Bloom's fuel cells is more expensive than alternatives. And when all this demand for energy starts to be met, they're going to start cutting out the higher cost energy sources, as you would expect any firm to do, right? And this investigation also talked about how they need to keep selling more on the front end to pay for the back end. So basically, there are very high service costs on the hardware they have out there in the field. That's important, right? We just talked about watching that services revenue component, which has a much lower gross margin than the actual hardware that they're selling. And the exciting news that came out recently was that Brookfield launched this $100 billion AI infrastructure program, and that $5 billion of that is going to be allocated towards 
towards a strategic partnership with Bloom Energy. I never liked this phrase, reimagining the future, but they're going to work together and Bloom's going to provide fuel cells for data center build outs that Brookfield is financing. That's great. And as a result, of course, you see this piece here by Fortune. Bloom Energy stock is up a thousand percent in a year because its fuel cells are solving AI's data center power problem. So anytime a share price increases that dramatically in such a short period of time, it's hype because intrinsic value doesn't get created that fast. You go back to Bloom's IPO filing document back in 2018. It's riddled with mentions of providing power supplies for a data center. So this isn't anything new, right? They've added this all along. And when we look at their new market cap, which absolutely exploded, and we look at their trailing 12-month revenues, you get a simple valuation ratio of 15. This is basically price to sales. That's double our catalog average. We calculate this for over 170 stocks. So it's richly priced. But when you consider that number, you need to consider it in the context of what that used to be in the past. And here you can see this chart showing that dramatic rise in SVR that resulted from a significant increase in share price without an accompanying increase in fundamentals. So when you see a 384% rise in share price in the last six months, that's hype, not sudden increase in intrinsic value. So always invest in companies, not stocks, right? Don't start playing musical chairs with momentum stocks. It's a good way to get burnt no matter what what the fin twats out there say. So points of contention here, the significant price appreciation is certainly a concern. For the first nine months of this year, they burnt through $300 million. So you're going to want to pay attention to cash burn and their ability to service that $1.2 billion in recourse debt. And there's some customer concentration risk. I won't even get into the convoluted related party revenues that they have, but one of their related parties accounted for the first nine months of this year, 23% of revenues, then two other customers, 19% and 15% respectively. So we don't like customer concentration risk. Biggest concern here probably is, is this a stopgap solution that will become less economically viable when energy supply catches up with demand? And in Bloom Energy's last call, they addressed this. The senior management said, I think the supply demand mismatch is so large that everybody who has a solution that is viable today has a market out there for them to address. Absolutely. We saw that with Colossus and Musk cobbling together all these turbines, right? And this gentleman, goes on to say you're going to see data center developers, hyperscalers wanting every solution that they can find. But he says there's very clearly a distinction between Bloom and other technologies. Well, it comes down to cost, right? Because as soon as all the dust settles, more expensive solutions are going to be pushed out. And they talk about how they're purpose built for data centers. That is true. You go back to their S1 filing document, they talk all about data centers. But is this an economically viable way to produce electricity with without subsidies doesn't seem like it. So right now, when it comes to the fuel cell thesis, which we looked at in a previous video, we identified 10 stocks out there. On our short list, you had Doosan, Bloom, and Saris. So fuel cell stocks in general don't seem to be hyped except Bloom, but that's never a good reason to invest in any thesis. Now that the company is hyped, it's certainly a lot less compelling. Now, the revenue growth is appealing, but you can find that elsewhere at a similar valuation with a lot better margins. You know, can they get beyond that 30% gross margin? And what does operating margin ever end up looking like? You need to ask yourself, what's the opportunity cost you're incurring for holding Bloom Energy? Are there better ways to play the demand for AI energy? I think a key question here is this. Is this exposure that I wouldn't mind having if AI energy subsides? You ask yourself, would I hold these stocks even if the AI trade didn't exist? Well, We've been holding the largest renewable energy stock in the world for well over a decade. And the AI energy boom, which now they're talking all about, right, it's the icing on the cake. It's not the reason why we're holding the stock. We just happen to enjoy that incidental benefit. So when it comes to natural gas that's going to be used to power Bloom's fuel cells, we did a recent piece on natural gas and the AI trade. It's rather interesting to watch because it looks at the various forms of electricity generation aside from just fuel cells. Give that a watch next. Thanks so much for taking the time to watch this video today.